each and every cent that is meant to improve the quality of lives of our people should go to where it's directed to. It should not land in the pockets of Zamani. It should not land in the pockets of MECs. Neither should it land in the pockets of the HODs or managers in departments. Money meant for development should be directed to developmental programs. All right, uh, good evening and welcome to Unfiltered on SABC3 <coughs> and Channel 404. I'm Desiree Chauke. South Africa is reeling from years of bad governance, which ignored the needs of the poorest of the poor under the leadership of selfish government officials. Wasteful expenditure, tender fraud, irregular spending, and all round corruption has characterized governance in all areas of government in recent years. And if revelations at the State Capture Commission are anything to go by, we've only just scratched the surface of a mountain when it comes to the extent of the rot and utter criminality by those we entrusted with executive powers. But newly appointed Premier of the Northern Cape Province, Dr. Zamani Sol, has set tongues wagging with his proposed approach to leadership. His plan for the Northern Cape government includes reduced and targeted spending, which will positively impact service delivery. The Premier has uh, vowed to bridge the gap between residents and their elected representatives. His plans have been described by some as lofty. Tonight we ask you, should politicians be applauded for doing what they're supposed to be doing anyway? Please note that Unfiltered uh, will move to a new slot next week, but we'll talk about that later on the show. For now, let's welcome our guest and thank him for making the time. Uh, Dr. Zamani Sol, thank you so much for making the time today. No, thanks, Desiree, for having me here and uh, thanks to your viewers. Perhaps let's start our conversation with that report that came out today from the Presidential Advisory Panel on Land Reform, especially yeah. as it relates to the Khoisan people. Uh, we know that in, in, in your province there's a bigger concentration of that population, yeah. uh, saying that they will leave it, they will give the minister, Togoti a discretion mm. uh, to decide how she interprets the Restitution of Land Rights Act so that she can include the Khoisan claims predating 1903. Yeah. What's your uh, response to no, that? No, as the province, we, we are very grateful with that, with that recommendation by the, by the presidential panel because uh, wars of dispossession took place uh, far before 1913. And uh, we are of the firm view that uh, that will assist us to resolve some of the problems of land hunger in the Northern Cape. So we highly welcome such a recommendation. Uh, just as a starting point, 1913 was quite a superficial cutting point. And so if there is any recommendation that we should go before 1913, as the province would highly welcome that. How will this change the land conversation in the Northern? Check, it, okay. should, it should definitely have an impact in how we look at the issues of land because South Africa is a country with high levels of inequality, and not inequality only in terms of income, but inequality in terms of asset, asset inequality, which is premised on land. Uh, if you look at the last report, which was uh, produced by the Department of, Department of Land Reform, 83% of the land in the Northern Cape is owned by 7% of the population. That is 83% of the land. We are, we are a very big province. 30%, the biggest in the country, 30 actually, of the land in terms mass, of land mass. Thirty percent of the land mass in the country, and eighty-three percent of the land is owned by seven percent of the population, and ninety-seven, ninety-three percent of the population owns less than fifteen percent of the land, and that actually includes indigenous communities. So it will actually assist us to address the major challenges which we are confronted with, which is asset inequality which basically rela relates to land ownership. Let's come back to the conversation of the day, your leadership in the province. Mm. You have been in leadership for a while. It, you've just ascended to uh, the number one yeah. spot now. What were your observations of leadership in the province yeah. as you were gunning for the top position? Uh, I've never occupied an executive position, basically it's for the first time. 
you were uh, in senior positions yes, in the party, was, senior was, positions was, for was, uh, uh, a I municipality. Was, yes, I was in the senior position of the ANC in the Northern Cape. I've been, I was elected in 1998 into the Provincial Executive Committee. I became the Deputy Provincial Secretary. I became the Provincial Secretary for almost 10 years. And now I'm the Provincial Chair. And I was never in the executive position. It's for the first time that I'm in the executive position. So <coughs> you've had an opportunity to observe the comings yeah. and goings in the province. Yes. Um, you, you, what were your thoughts watching the things that you now say you want to turn around? Chep, we, we, we are another generation of leaders in the ANC. There's been a generation before us and we are another generation of leaders and particularly with regard to an ANC which is a governing party. And uh, what actually happened in 1994, uh, there's a whole lot of developments that took place where leadership which were responsible for government since 1994, some of them just got absorbed uncritically into state protocols and uh, institutional values and cultures of a purely liberal democratic system. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are another generation of leaders. We had an opportunity to look at how this system works and our responsibility is to change it for the better. If we we'll have to put it uh, upside down, that becomes our responsibility to do it in order to make it work better, mm -hmm. and particularly for the poorest of the poor. So since becoming a Premier, um, you've gotten a lot of praise for saying the right things, but also uh, keeping your word but mostly for sacrificing personal gain yeah. for the benefit of society. How are you receiving all of this praise? Uh, do you think we're praising a fish for swimming? Check there's mixed res responses to that. Uh, there are people who firmly believe that it's a populist stance, taking into cognizance the fact that uh, our electoral support in the province has been significantly reduced from 64 to 57. But there are those who actually firmly believe that uh, this is a new dawn of real commitment to Batupile principle. Mm -hmm. For me, <coughs> I don't want to attach concepts to it. I don't want to attach concepts to it. For me, it's about us giving practical responses to practical problems which are encountered by the people in the Northern Cape. I received an SMS uh, from a woman in Straitenburg confirming to me that they've received a new ambulance. And her child almost died in an old ambulance with the oxygen machine which was not working. Yeah. And she sends me that SMS to say, thank you, Premier, we've received this ambulance, new ambulance, but I just want you to know that two weeks back my child almost died in an ambulance because the oxygen machine was not working. So, so you can attach whatever concepts you want to attach to that, but for me, that is basically the ideology that drives me. That's the ideology that drives the organization which I serve, which is the African National Congress, to be of best service to the ordinary masses which constitutes our primary motive for so What brought the ANC into power? is the poorest of the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the downtrodden masses of South Africa. So. Our responsibility is to give service to them in a visible and significant way. As commendable as one would think that is, there are questions about what the basis of that approach is, some saying that you're still operating on the old provincial growth and development strategy of the previous government. Yeah. What, what is the basis? No, no the, basis, the basis are just simple, that uh, you know the crafts of politics, the craft of politics is about serving. We, we exist for nothing else. We exist to serve communities. And uh, we are busy now, we are in a process of reviewing the provincial growth and development strategy, and we are in a process of formulating our investment book in the Northern Cape to ensure that we'll be in a position to attract much more investments into the province because we are sitting with major problems. Northern Cape is the capital of poverty in South Africa. I don't know whether you know that. 54% of households in the Northern Cape are poor households. Which means if you go to Northern Cape, every second house is a poor household that they don't know where their next meal will come from. If you go to the Northern Cape, 26% of, we've got 26% of unemployment 
And from that 26%, 60% is young people. Roughly interpreted, 50% of young people in the province are, are unemployed. So we're going to take a break now, and when we return, I'll ask you about how you got to this place, because the Northern yeah. Cape used to be almost like the breadbasket of yeah. the country. We're talking to the Premier of uh, the Northern Cape, Dr. Zamani So We'll continue this conversation after the break. We're talking to the Premier of the Northern Cape, Dr. Zamani So, um, the clip we played earlier when we started the show about yeah. you uh, directing officials, government officials, to say the public purse will only go to where it's meant for. The yeah. conversation about uh, uh, the plundering of the public purse is not just uh, provincial, it's, it's also it's national, national with yes. all the commissions we see yeah. uh, going on at the moment. And you've previously lamented the fact that the previous mm. administration left you with uh, a, a black hole of like 22, is it? 22 million, 220 million rands in the negative balance and 2.7 billion in deficits. Are you finding that in your new administration you're funding debt as opposed to uh, allocating monies to your ideal projects? Check uh, what we've been experiencing over the past years, even national government, is erosion of our fiscus. It's happening national and it's also happening in provinces and uh, which might be worse in the next three years up until there is dramatic increase in the in the performance of the economy so what we then have to do is to ensure that we embark on serious cost cutting measures because if you go to the northern cape you're a very small province population of 1.2 million and our annual budget is about 18.2 billion and of that 18.2 billion, 3 billion rent, it's budget deficit, it's debt. And 60% uh, of that budget goes to compensation, payment of salaries to public servants. So I met with a team from Treasury and I told them, here's the manifest of the ANC. We've invited the people of South Africa to be part and parcel of the new chapter of hope. What is it that we can do in order to ensure that we address all the issues which are tabulated in the manifest of the ANC. Guys from Treasury, I spent the whole night with them. In fact, and what you're saying yes. takes us to what you were saying earlier, that people are saying your pronouncement are, are populist. Yes. Because people have been saying he doesn't have the resources yes, exactly. to make these things happen. Yes, I sat them down and said, what is it that is possible? They said to me, Premier, we do, if we are going to continue doing things the same way we've been doing over the past five, ten years, there's very little that we, are, we will be able to do in order to ensure that we implement the manifest of the ANC. What we need to do is to cut costs. That's the context of the cut cost thing or of the cost cutting measures that we've embarked on. We need to cut costs to open up space for the implementation of the manifest of the ANC. But you can't embark on austerity measures by shouting from the rooftop. Yeah. You should become the force of example. If I'm saying we need to cut costs in order to redirect the little resources that we have for development projects, it should first start with the office of the Premier. So when I get into my office and I'm told there's 1.4 million rent that is budgeted to buy a new car for the Premier, I should tell them we are here to cut costs in order to redirect these that resources. Money can be better yes, used it elsewhere. can be better used elsewhere. So I can't be drowned in luxury and expect public servants and my colleagues in the executive to cut costs. It should first start with me. And it should start with small things. You can't start with big things. If you can't save a rent, there is no way that you'll be able to save a thousand rent. If you can't save a thousand rent, you can't save a million. If you can't save a million, you can't save a billion. So it starts with us saving on small things which are unnecessary, which are wastages in the system. And we've started with that. We've Premier, placed I ourselves don't effectively. don't like uh, doing this to you, yes. but we also have to pay for our supper. Okay. So we're going to take a break and just hold your thoughts there because we're going to keep unpacking those little cost-cutting uh, cost cutting cutting areas yes. that you've been talking okay. about. Let's take a break. We'll be back in a moment.
Okay, we asked you several social media questions. Yeah, uh, um, is the Northern Cape Province taking bold steps in the prioritization of service delivery instead of fancy lifestyles by government officials? We also asked you, should politicians be applauded when they do what they should be doing as a matter of course? That's our discussion today. Let's take a look at some of the tweets that have come through in this regard. Uh, King Razor Africa saying this man is making his president and more importantly, our province and country proud, leading by example. Isaac Muitzanape saying, ask him to give you the number of registered engineers in his province, competency levels. This will help us understand how efficient development will be in this province. Right, and Sonobile Spidele saying, I like the fact that he lives in his house and see the idea of living in a state house as wasteful expenditure. Honestly, all these government officials earn enough. No need for them to stay in the luxurious state houses. The money should be used for other things to help the poor. And I'm just going to go back to that uh, tweet that spoke about the number of engineers yes. in the province. Some of the concerns about your way of doing things being that there isn't, just simply isn't enough capacity in the Northern Cape to fulfill all these ideals. Yes, that is 100% that is correct. Uh, on, on a number of areas, there is undersupply of capacity. There's undersupply of engineers in the province. There's undersupply of doctors, undersupply of nurses and as well as and the supply uh, of teachers, uh, particularly teachers in science, there's an undersupply. That's the reason why we agreed that we need to go out on a vigorous campaign to ensure that we do get these skills into the province. And particularly now that we took a decision that we are going to establish a state construction company in the province. And the responsibility of that state construction company is to implement some of the critical infrastructure pro projects of the provincial government mm -hmm. and as well as to serve as an institution for training and particularly training of young people in different skills. So there is an undersupply of engineers yep. and we'll have to go out on a vigorous campaign to ensure that we The do concerns about the construction <coughs> school, the envisaged construction school excluding entrepreneurs? No, it does not exclude entrepreneurs. Uh, the, the government in any country including the Northern Cape province and in the in national, will always remain the biggest procurer of goods and services. There will still be certain projects where we are definitely going to need some private service providers to come and assist with implementation. Our infrastructure budget in the province is about four billion. And our target is within the next five, six, seven years, the state construction company should be able to implement about 30% of our infrastructure spent. So 70% will still go to private service providers whilst yep. we are busy strengthening the capacity of the state construction company. But there's advantages around establishing that. There's advantages around establishing that. For the first time, when we've got a state construction company where the people of the Northern Cape have quality RDP houses, which construction thereof is not profit driven, and number two, it will give us an opportunity where we take young people on board and we can give them the necessary training that, that they need in order for them to be able to go anywhere in the, in the country and anywhere in the province and get decent jobs. So let's go back to that conversation you were having with Treasury where they were saying that uh, resources are pretty limited. Yes. What kind of support are they giving you to be able to achieve the very least that you want to achieve? so no. that there can be a sense of movement. Yeah. No, that's their responsibility. I'm the executive authority of the Northern Cape. So part of my executive responsibility is to exercise oversight over Treasury and to articulate the vision and the strategic direction for the province. And their responsibilities is to advise and support me in doing that. That's the responsibility of Treasury. Mm -hmm. Treasury is not a standalone outside the old uh, outside the whole design of state. They are part and parcel of the state in the Northern Cape. So there's a, if there's a strategic vision that has been articulated, the expectation is that Treasury must sit with their bureaucrats, with their technical expertise, to look at measures in which we'll be able to implement that. And Treasury is satisfied with your vision? Yes, definitely, they are. 
Let's yeah. talk about those small incremental uh, victories you were talking about in terms of uh, cost cutting and cost saving. What has yeah. been achieved so far? <coughs> Check, so far we've been able, I'm certain we are the only province in the country where emissions in the province, there was no spending spree on new cars and all of that. All of those resources, we are going to redirect them. We said we are going to redirect those resources in order for us to buy ambulances. And it will be impactful? Yes, it, it will be impactful to buy ambulances. For now, we've already distributed more than about 50 ambulances. The 17 which are coming within the next two weeks that we are going to distribute throughout the province. We're a vast province, yeah. partially populated and extremely remote. So we can't allow a situation where people have to wait for ambulances for four or five hours, others even wait for ambulances for the whole day. About three weeks back, there was an article in the newspapers that a woman had to give birth at home whilst waiting for an ambulance. So when you're a citizen <coughs> and you have been able to be efficiently collected by the ambulance, yes. what happens at the destination? Are you getting a proper health care when you arrive at the public hospital? Check. There's two departments which we agreed that they will be the apex programs of the sixth administration. It's the Department of Education and the Department of Health. We want to improve our outcomes with regard to the Department of Education. We can't accept it that in the country out of nine provinces, out of nine provinces, in terms of metric outcomes, we are number seven. We are not accepting that. We need to improve. At some point, we were number one for three consecutive years. We managed to break the glass ceiling of 90%, where the province went beyond 90%. I firmly believe we've got capacity to go back there. Number two, our primary focus as well, as an apex pro program, is to improve our health outcomes, is to improve the health profiles of the people of the Northern Cape. Because health and education, those are the biggest guzzlers, biggest, con biggest guzzlers of our provincial budget. So we are also looking at improving our health outcomes and uh, improving our health out outcomes to ensure that we've got ambulance services that would be able to take people to clinics and we are computerizing uh, our emergency services now where people will be able, as you Uber here in Joburg, they must be able to Uber an ambulance in the Northern Cape because we are building a modern province. That's what we are striving to achieve. Number two, but we'll have, in order to also improve the quality of healthcare services, there, we need to get doctors and nurses to go to the province. But our biggest disadvantage is that we are competing with much more dynamic provinces, much greater Dr. Sol, opportunities. Yet again, yes. I'm going to have to ask you to hold on to your thoughts and also say goodbye to our viewers on SABC3. We hope you'll be able to join us as we continue with the conversation on SABC News Channel 404. Uh, join us again when we come back from this break. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us on Unfiltered tonight and uh, we'd like to thank our guest, the Premier of the Northern Cape, Dr. Zamani Sol, for agreeing to stay with us for an extended version of the show. We were talking about your two priority areas, yeah. which is health and education, education. Yeah. and we will go back to them later, but I just want to find out from you how you are partnering with the business society of the yeah. province yeah. to achieve your goals? Yes, I think that's a, thanks Desiree. That's a very important question because I've already mentioned to you that 54% of households in the province are poor. 50% uh, of the workforce, youth workforce is unemployed. So there is absolutely no way that the government would be able to address all those challenges alone. That's the reason why over the past two months, I've been engaging business sector right throughout the province and particularly focusing on the, on the mining houses. I had a number yeah. of engagement with mining houses and all of them, they've expressed their commitment to work with the government to try and ensure that we launch some kind of coordinated attack on these two major challenges in the province. Uh, what then we agreed on as a way forward, we are going to, we are busy establishing the Northern Cape Growth and Investment Council, 
which will be operational by September, the terms of reference are worked So out. formal interaction with formal business. Formal interaction. We need that platform for formal interaction where we'll be able to come up with a social compact about what are the opportunities in the province, how do we exploit those opportunities. But in our exploitation of those opportunities, how do we ensure that the people of the Northern Cape derive maximum benefits? So we are creating that platform for engagement. Some of the mining houses reported good financial reports this week. Yes. Uh, is that encouraging for the province? It is encouraging because it actually adds to the GDP of the province. I don't know whether you know we are amongst one of the few provinces in the country who is contributing to the national fiscus less than our population size. We are contributing about 2.4% to the GDP of the country. Even and if you're still sitting yes, at number our, six of the contribution. Yes, our population, our, our population is 2.4, which means we are not being there's subsidized. There's a need to, there's a need not, to increase yes, that we are contribution, not, we are, we are not being subsidized by any province. We, as the Northern Cape, we are actually subsidizing other provinces. But I firmly believe we can perform better on that if we manage to ensure that we mark at a maximum level we exploit the natural endowment that we have. For an example, I'm of the firm view that for the next 100 years, the history of mining in this country is right there in the Northern Cape. For Absolutely. the next 100 years, nowhere so else. The question one will ask you is how did we get here? Uh, yes. I mean, if you look at the history of South Africa and the uh, development of the transport network around the country, yes. it started in the Northern Cape. Yes, exactly. How so, did we get here? So, 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 so what we'll have to do, instead of bemoaning the past, that the Northern Cape has been used as an extraction center. Northern Cape, that's the what Northern Cape The past always helps as a reference. Oh, yes, though. it does help. But we've been bemoaning this thing for the past 25 years, yeah. that the Northern Cape is used as an extraction center. If you look in terms of your center periphery uh, development trajectory, we've always been regarded as the periphery, where you extract raw materials to the center. And when you extract raw materials and you transport them out of the province, you take value out of the province, you are shipping jobs out of the province. So we'll have to take a completely different approach, and that is what this leadership, currently this leadership, wants to ensure that in the mining sector there should be increased levels of beneficiation where we'll be able to increase the number of jobs which are created by the mines by adding value to the raw material which they extract in the province. So one of the other problems that, has, that keeps coming up, it's a, another national conversation but yeah. specifically uh, for the Northern Cape is party patronage where uh, professionals are said to be leaving the province either to go to other parts of the country yeah. or to go elsewhere in the world because if you're not a card-carrying member then you are not open to opportunities. Yeah. Check the, the, the reality of the matter is like any like our program nationally we need to develop a capable developmental state. If we fail to do that, if we fail to do that Five years from now, when we go to the next elections, we would have had increased numbers, numbers of people who are unemployed, we would have increased number of people who are living in poverty. So at the center of addressing the, socio, the, 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 the socioeconomic challenges of the province, we need a strong developmental state, we need a strong private sector. Are you going to reach out so, to professionals? So that is exactly what, there's no other option. We don't have any other option but is to ensure that at the cutting edge of our provincial government, we've got people with relevant skills, with adequate training, will be able to ensure that we are going to attain some of the issues that we said we want to, we want to do for the people of the Northern Cape. You've spoken a lot about education yeah. and training forms a, a big part of that. Um, there is concerns that educational facilities in the province are not up to standard. Uh, mm -hmm. The curriculum in the Salt Plaiki University, which is a, a fairly new institution, how are you making use of these uh, already available resources mm -hmm. to advance these, advance these ideals? Yeah. Let me start with the issue of the Salt Plaiki University. Salt Plaiki University is still at the formative stages. Student population of less than 2,000. And in terms of their own projection by 2024, 20, the student population would have grown from 7,000, would have grown to almost 7,500 or 8,000. So it's still at the formative stages, but we appreciate the impact and the contribution that the university is making to the province, not only in terms of 
they are curricular, but uh, that's massive infrastructure investment of about 4.2 billion in a small province like the Northern Cape. So that has made a major impact. It has added some kind of vibrancy and dynamism to the economy of Kimberley. That Is the momentum appreciate. to that vibrancy though? Yes, that we appreciate because, because it's a massive investment and we are looking forward at further investments in order to finish up that particular program with an increased number of students. But the other thing, why the emphasis on education? 73% of poor households in the province there's the major contributing factor, the major contributing factor to poverty in the Northern Cape is years of schooling and lack of training. That is the contributing factor. If so poverty and unemployment, those are just mere symptoms. The actual problem is years of schooling and lack of education. It's less than 7% of the population of the Northern Cape that have got post matric qualifications which is lesser than anywhere in the or country. Or even up to metric level. Yes, yes, which uh, they've got lesser than, post seven, it's only it's se less than 7% of the population that has got post-matric qualification. So, which means 93% of the population does not have post-matric qualification. Hence, the high levels of unemployment and particularly amongst young people. So, if we say we want to break the back of unemployment, we'll have to ensure that we get much more younger people in artisanal and vocational training to ensure that we create much greater opportunities for young people in the Northern Cape. Those who deserve, there should be not even a single child in the Northern Cape who deserves to go to tertiary institution that should be moving up and down the streets. So that is the reason why we are focused at ensuring that young people from the Northern Cape, they get much improved opportunities now to go to tertiary institutions and post matric training. Besides unemployment and high levels of poverty, you're faced with other societal issues such yeah. as um, the drinking problem in the province, yeah. which is said to be at very high levels, uh, alcohol abuse, and uh, the incidence of HIV AIDS. Yes. What sort of conversations are you having in this regard? But at the end of the day, the, the, the issue should not be besides because these are all symptoms of the socio-economic challenges that we confront in the province. If you are sitting with half your youth workforce unemployed, you'll sit with problems of high levels of usage of drugs and alcohol abuse. So we, part of addressing that is to address the problems of unemployment. But there are intervention programs by the Office of the Premier and as well as the Department of Social Development in the, in the province in mm -hmm. terms of ensuring that we intervene and try to ensure that we curb the issues of alcohol abuse. And we were told uh, at some point that the Northern Cape, we are the capital of uh, alcohol abuse in the country. Yeah. So we need to come up with comprehensive approaches. There is no silver bullet that will assist us, but we need to come up with a comprehensive approach that takes the totality of the welfare of the people of the Northern Cape into cognizance, both in terms of the socioeconomic challenges which people confront and with regard to, to, to social welfare probl problems which they confront. So we need to come up with a comprehensive approach. HIV is one of the major challenges which we are confronted with. Yeah. And there's an increased number of people who are on our treatment regime program. And that in itself also assists us uh, to ensure that uh, we increase the, the, the accessibility of, of people to, to, to treatment programs. It's not all doom and gloom though, is it? I mean, yeah. we were talking about the Salt Lake University uh, just now, which has just uh, been open uh, to, to, to admissions. Um, but just this week, you were able to host the National Science Week, yes. uh, which is quite a, 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 a big thing for yeah. a province, but a province that also hosts the SKA. SKA. Yes, that in itself, it's very important for us. And uh, we need young children of the Northern Cape to become scientists. That's young children of South Africa. Yes, I no, no, no. yes, I'm representing the Northern Cape. Yeah, I've got a constituency that I serve, specific, Granted. clearly demarcated constituency which I'm responsible for. But we won't be able to do that up until we get quality education from primary to secondary schooling. And up until we've been able to ensure that we recruit uh, high quality science teachers to the Northern Cape. That's the reason why when we look at this thing in terms of what the nature of our province, we'll have to look at different dispensation of attracting 
such high caliber scientist teachers to come to our province. So you're here this week as yeah. part of your responsibilities, your party responsibilities, you're in Johannesburg. Um, one of the big conversations in the country is constitutionalism and yeah. how uh, different uh, arms of the state understand their role in this term. Yeah. You studied this respect in your legal studies. What are we not getting uh, about understanding constitutional responsibilities? The conversation flowing right up from the presidency to parliament, the public protector, mm. court judgments coming out saying people are not understanding their constitutional mandates. No. <clears throat> I think the public discourse on constitutionalism in South Africa is necessary. You go to old democracies. You go to old democracies like the U.S. Compared to this 25-year-old Europe, one. yes, compared to the 25-year-old. That debate is still raging. It's still raging, and it's raging at the most vibrant way. And that is what we expect in this country. The only way of strengthening constitutional democracy is for us to have deliberative engagement about what this democracy means for us. Basically what you've got, you've got three arms of state. All of them have got a primary responsibility to protect the constitution. The executive, which is led by President Cyril Ramaphosa, has got a responsibility to protect the constitution. The legislature, which is the parliament, has got a responsibility to protect and uphold the constitution. Even the courts, judges, judges are servants of the constitution. They are not rulers of the constitution. Is it not problematic when that conversation is not be developing at a parallel speed as service provision? Because sometimes there's yes. a sense that uh, it's done at the expense of everything else. Yes, but what I'm actually saying is that our democracy in South Africa is still at a neonatic stage. You are still at the baby faces. So this robust debate about what constitutes the key pillars and about the integrities of our constitution is necessary. If it's not taking place now, when is it going to take place? So we should welcome the debate. There will always be certain confusion around certain areas of constitutionalism. We should welcome that and be open-minded in approaching that. Like the issue around the powers of the, of the public protector. That's a welcome debate which we should welcome and engage robustly about what would be the best way for the country to pursue. But linked to that, South Africans are not going to eat the constitution. That's the reality of the matter. And the constitution is not self-executing. So our responsibility as public servants is to ensure whilst there is this raging debate about what the structure of our constitutional democracy, the most important thing is that South Africans are expecting us to deliver services and improve their quality of lives and ensure that there's job opportunities and, and uh, we, we, we come up with programs to fight the high levels of poverty as well. You're watching Unfiltered. We're in a conversation with the Premier of the Northern Cape, Dr. Zamani So We're going to take a break. Stay with us. Uh, we'll be back in a moment to look at some of your thoughts on social media. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us in this conversation with the Premier of the Northern Cape, Dr. Zamane Sol. Before we continue with our conversation, I'm going to look at some of the tweets you've sent through regarding this conversation. Let's take a look at those. So Nabile Spidele again saying, um, I wish other provinces can follow suit. I'm actually proud of the Premier's bold steps to do something that has never been done before. I I paused a bit there because I thought we had seen that tweet already, but it's a second tweet from the same person. Let's take a look at another one. All right, we seem to be... All right, we'll come back to the tweets later on. We seem to be stuck mm -hmm. on that tweet. Premier, um, one of the things that excited our viewers, especially on social media mm -hmm. in the lead up to this conversation, was the conversation about the ambulances, mm -hmm. uh, you not staying in the official residence to cut costs. Are those meaningful actions? They could be symbolic, but uh, 
what is important is the message that comes out of that. As soon as I got ele elected as the premier, I received, I got inundated by messages from some of the students that we fund who are at universities. In the Northern Cape, we've got the Nord Northern Cape uh, Premier's Basari Trust Fund. I got calls from them, many of them, telling me that we are considering coming back to the province because we've not been able to get our allowances. The students who are funded by it. When I make an inquiry, I was told that the Premier's Basari Fund has got a negative bank, bank balance. Oh, wow. So at the same time, I'm being told that I must move to a state house which costs millions whilst I've got my own house. So why can't we sell the state house? It's just a practical response. Why can't we sell, to sell a state, the state house, redirect that money to the Premier's Basari Trust Fund? Which is a in order, in, Yes, in order to resolve a problem that we are s confronted with right now, where students are threatening that we are coming back to the province because we've not been able to get our yeah. allowances. And so I should drown in the, in the executive luxury of staying in a state house, whilst there are students from the well, Northern Cape. Are you providing Cape, excuses? Yes, who can't get their allowances. They could, they could, all these small things that we've decided to do as the Northern Cape, they might look symbolic, they might be symbolic, but they send a strong message out there that we are not here to be drowned in executive luxuries. I'm not a premier for some boy for people to put a royal red carpet for. I, how do I, when I go to address people about their state, I present the state of the province address. In a province with 54% 50, poverty, I get on a, I got put on a royal red carpet, I'm yep. being celebrated. It, it can be. It I just, know two months is a bit of a short sense. time to be able <laughs> yeah. to measure, but how much headway have you made? Which areas yes. have you been able to make a uh, visible impact on? No, I won't be able to make a visible impact for now because these things take a lo quite long time because it's about planning and planning and planning and implementation after that. But the issue, what is important, is that we, as the Northern Cape, executive we managed to send a strong message outside there. yeah public servants know about that there is no time for wastages there is no time for frills there is no time for us to be drowned in executive luxuries what the little send that we have the little send that we have should be redirected to development project i think we've managed to send that strong message yeah. and everybody is aware of it up until the lowest public servant in the, in the Northern Cape. They know that that's not our business. We are here to ensure that each and every cent that we generate as the provincial government that we have in our fiscals should go to improvement of the quality of lives of our people. But I think that strong message is there and we need that as the foundation for us to move forward. So I suppose the big question now is, and you've probably been asked this question a hundred yeah. times, what sort of pushback are you experiencing both at provincial level but also the conversation around the other eight uh, premiers who are saying, you know, you're making us look bad. No, other eight premiers have got their own challenges. At the budget of the premier of Houthi, I think it's ten times more than the budget of the provincial government of the Northern Cape. So they are sitting with their own different challenges and check, I know all of them. I know they are highly skilled, very creative thinkers. And uh, you, at not even a single moment can you doubt their commitment at ensuring that we improve the quality of life of the people of the Northern Cape. Otherwise, the National Executive Committee of the ANC would not have made us premiers. I've, most of them I grew up with. I know their level of commitment to yeah. ensuring that there's a radical economic transformation and we improve the, the, the lives of the people of South Africa. I don't doubt that, but they are sitting with their own different challenges. Uh, for us, as the province, we are sitting with peculiar challenges of being a small, big landmass, vast, peri-urban area, and uh, those are some challenges that we are sitting with, which necessitates different approaches. Right, as we chase the uh, 
conclusion of this conversation, let's take a look at another tweet. Uh, we'll look at the poll as well. Lina Mutibi Sefani Makoro saying, uh, Desiree, can Dr. Sol also deal with the exporting of manganese only to be returned as finished product that should really assist in building the Northern Cape into a formidable province beneficiation, one of the oldest yes. conversations yes. in the Northern Cape. Yes, it, it is an old older old conversation and I just see here she speaks about manganese. Northern Cape is got eighty percent reserves of manganese in the world. Eighty percent. Uh, it's there in Could the safely Cape. be called a resource yes, rich province. Exactly we are. Uh, the mineral endowment of the Northern Cape is unparalleled. So our responsibility as this leadership and is to push very hard to ensure that there is beneficiation that is taking place. But there are some mining houses that have already started with the process of beneficiation. Last year, I went to Halakadima Manganese in the Northern Cape. They've put up a cinder plant, massive thing, 4.2 billion rent investment, and they've managed to create permanent jobs there. That is exactly our expectations for most of the mining companies, most of the mining houses, to ensure that at least there is a process of adding value to most of to the to the minerals which they are extracting from the province, and that will really assist us to ensure that we create much more job opportunities. Let's talk about Dr. Zamani. So the person, yeah, you represent everything that a young child in the Northern Cape would hope to be. Yeah. While you were pursuing your political career, you were also studying on the side, yes. and you've been able to achieve some of the things that you say that uh, um, this children in the province struggle to even reach matric level. Yeah. When they're watching us now and thinking, oh gosh, it's possible, what, how, how did you achieve all of this? Check it's through hard work. It's basically through hard work. You need to work very hard. And uh, if you go to the province, there's much roaming informal settlement. I'm a product of an informal settlement. My mom built the house where I grew up herself. It's not like getting somebody to come and build. It's an informal house. That's and where yet I, here you are. Yes, that's where I grew up. So it actually tells you that the democratic dispensation opens up opportunities for all children of South Africa. So the responsibility is on the young generation in South Africa to work very hard. And uh, with the opportunities which are there, it's quite possible to reach to reach to reach to reach unmatched heights and uh, i firmly believe that there's much greater opportunities for this generation of young people in south africa and that is an offering yeah. of the democratic dispensation just in closing what are your thoughts on the political and economic climate in the country yeah. i know you were saying citizens should be encouraged that we're having this robust conversations yeah. but sometimes they worry that they're left behind in these processes yeah. and nothing is done in terms of governance check what what happened in terms of our constitutional framework we've got liberal democracy liberal democracy can go either way where it slides into some form of pseudo dictatorship or into deliberative democracy. I firmly believe that South Africa, we are moving into deliberative democracy, where South Africans are saying our responsibility is not to elect leadership at five-year intervals. But in between, we need to have a process of deliberative engagement. And uh, w that's the reason why I'm saying that the public discourse, which is there around... Where are the jobs in the meantime? Uh, yes, around constitutionalism, public discourse around the nature of our democracy, we should welcome it. Because we are sliding, we are moving in the right direction towards the liberative democracy, where South Africans want meaningful engagement Dr. with their public representatives. Dr. Sol is giving me a political answer, but we're yeah. time tied. But thank you so much thank for coming through much. to talk to us this evening. No, uh, for doing me. very well for his province, uh, the Premier of the Northern Cape, Dr. Zamani Sol. Thanks thank again. You, thank you very Thanks much for, for watching Unfiltered uh, on uh, SABC3 and Channel 404. As we said at the beginning of the show, from next week, the show moves to a Monday evening. So we hope you can still join us and support us then. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you very much for having me. Then I can go and sleep now. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly. Aren't you going back to Irene? No, no, no. We are done there. We are meeting tomorrow at 10. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>